And I think uh, the uh, content providers should be flattered that their media has become so pervasive in the way uh, students uh, and faculty view the world that they can't, you one really cannot teach classes about almost any subject now without including uh, their content. And so they should uh, be flattered and they should welcome this development. Um, the commenters didn't really seem to object to the renewal of the exemption uh, that we proposed, but rather they, uh, they claim that we're misusing the exemption, that somehow we're using it uh, when lower quality alternatives have been available. And, and Professor DeCherney uh, talked a little bit about that. And, and let me just underscore a couple of points. First of all, uh, uh, their, their comments uh, talked a lot about the screen capture technologies. Um, but as apparently, you know, again, in their, in their testimony, they went to identify exactly what screen capture technologies do they consider to be non-circumvention, uh, non uh, and therefore do, do not implicating of Section 1201. And my understanding is in the uh, hearing in Los Angeles, a specific issue came up, and once again, the rights holders will not specifically identify what kind of uh, technologies they would consider to be kosher, but even if there were technologies uh, that they would consider not to be circumventing, uh, there could be some other rights holder out there who, uh, who claims that it is circumventing. And so um, uh, simply saying that there's a technology out there that might help us doesn't really uh, uh, translate into an effective uh, provision on the ground where we need to have certainty uh, when we're, when we're uh, working with a, a large number of faculty members and students. Second of all, um, the, the issue of quality is that, that I think quality is always needed. High quality is always needed. Um, uh, to the extent that, that if, if, if the rights holders think that the quality is important in the product, uh, that they made it high quality for a reason, then, then it, it just doesn't, it baffles the imagination as to why that quality somehow is less important in the classroom. If it's, if it's important to have good quality in your basement when you're watching it at home, then it, there simply is no reason to say it doesn't, that quality is not necessary in the classroom, and especially when you're watching it on a much bigger screen sometimes in the classroom, and so the distortion is greater. Professor DeCherney mentioned the issue of authenticity, uh, also the notion that, that standards evolve and what people expect, expectation of consumers evolve, and uh, uh, what was seen as uh, uh, remarkable three years ago or five years ago now could seem sort of, uh, 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 again, almost distracting now. And, and in, in the last image that, that the Professor DeCherney put up from the Martin Scorsese movie, you know, which was talking about all of these uh, 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 wonderful optical illusions and wonderful uh, special effects that now look absurd, but at the time to a, to a child seemed to be very, very compelling. Uh, the standards evolve and what we see, uh, what we expect evolves and, and uh, uh, the um, not having the same quality really can uh, dilute the impact, uh, the emotional impact, the, 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 the force of the message, and again, uh, not having the same quality of the product as it's, it's, it's made available uh, to the consumer or, or made available in, in theatrical releases really uh, weakens the impact and the educational uh, use of the work. And, and finally, uh, you know, if the, the quality of these other technologies, such as uh, screen capture, if it's so good, uh, then why do we bother, why do they bother using CSS at all? I mean, there's sort of like a logical circularity here. Uh, if, if, it, if it is good uh, using these alternative technologies, then there's no point in having uh, encryption. But if the encryption really does achieve something, if there really is the, 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 what you get without the encryption uh, uh, isn't as good, then that uh, makes our case that that, that is, uh, that, that there is a need to get the high quality material and that there really is a qualitative difference between what you can see with screen capture 
as opposed to what you can see uh, through through circumvention. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, what do you like today? Um, okay, can, uh, I don't need to push this. You can hear me. That uh, sounds like you can. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> um, thank you very much for having me today again. And um, I participated two years ago. My name is Martine Karatwright, and I'm from Ramsey Community College. And um, part of my response was to support the group that um, Peter Deterrent, their, their document that they submitted, which um, I thought really everything that they discussed in there regarding how the exemptions are being implemented, it, it just rings very true. So I wanted to just come in person and um, just talk about how it's playing out at the community college where I work. As I said in my um, document that I filed, it's almost half of all undergraduate students attend at community colleges. And in this room, we, we, ha we do have a lot of representation from universities. So um, it, it was very helpful um, when you expanded the 2010 exemption to go beyond just what's in a college's library because, um, as I pointed out during the last round of hearings, co community colleges were just operating with much less resources than typical research universities. So um, just being able to use anything we legally obtain is very helpful. And also to include all college professors you know, rather than just one um, um, specializing in film studies. So, uh, what, what has happened over the last couple of years since the new exemption um, was um, put forward is that at my college, a colleague and I have we put together a workshop. And the point of, that I'm trying to make here is how the exemption that you crafted in 2010 is being implemented in a way that's ethical and responsible and thoughtful and reflective. So uh, these workshops that we've had, we've had a couple of them They're at my college, and there's been a lot of interest. They've been well attended. We've had between 30 and 40 faculty administrators attend these workshops. And in it, um, I talk about like the legal parameters, and then my colleague, he shows some of the examples of how he uses it um, in a day-to-day -day basis. So just examples at my college that kind of repeat what the charities group said of how faculty are using the exemption. Um, the crea a creative writing instructor would use, he uses clips of the Judy Garland Wizard of Oz movie to show um, how to construct narrative tension and to discuss strategies that writers use in order to build um, their story. So this is very helpful to students um, to see these examples. Another example is an economics professor at the community college level using clips from um, famous and popular movies to show different economic theories. The one that I remember him discussing was the zero sum game. And then we also, another example that I recall is a strong astronomy professor using clips to um, bring forward principles of astronomy that students can discuss in the classroom. So it's being implemented in a thoughtful way that um, is across the disciplines at the community college level where almost half of all students attend. Um, my specialty of teaching is first year writing and first year writing actually um, has a it's it's not really acknowledged as much as it should be for the importance that it serves because almost every college student will take a first year writing class. And so we look to, we have organizations that we look to to tell us what we should teach as best practices or what students need to know currently. And the groups that I'm involved in and that um, put forward standards are the Writing Program Administrators, which we call the WPA, and the National Council of Teachers of English, which we call the NCTE. But one of the things we do is they create like uh, protocols or documents that we look to to see how we should revise our curriculum. And just to give you an example, since all of the organizations that are specializing in the teaching of first year writing tell us that we should be teaching digital literacy and informational literacy, and this, this goes right to the heart of what this exemption addresses. So from the writing program administrator's first, first year learning outcomes, this is specifically for what students would take during their first semester of college writing. Um, by the end of the first year of composition, students should be able to use electronic environments for drafting, revising, editing, and sharing text. And that's a quote from the learning outcomes. So, you know, when something's legal, like the way that the exemption has been crafted for faculty to use, <coughs> then we can teach about it. And I can, <coughs> excuse me, I can have workshops. We can create workshops to teach about how to do things legally. On the other hand, when it isn't legal, then it's then it's hard to address it in the classroom. So uh, 
if you recall, the uh, evidence presented by the EFF three years ago showed that what's happening like on YouTube with the bitter community, that these kind of documents and texts are being created, but until students are included in a mix of what, in a broad range of what you are uh, allowing to fall under the exemption, it's, it's very difficult to figure out how to teach about how to do something that we know they're already doing, but that we can't really talk about because they're not supposed to be doing it. So um, it's just, it, I would agree with everything that Charney said, um, Professor Charney said about that the use of digital text and media in the classroom, and specifically in first year writing classroom, is just a given and it reflects what we are charged with teaching in this day and age. And so I really um, would ask you to expand it to include students, not just the film study students, but all college students. Um, that's, my, that's the end of my testimony. Thank you. Okay, you've got two minutes left, and I just wanted to ask one okay. question because you talked about your first year writing class, and yes. you said students should be able to use electronic environments for drafting, editing, and presenting text. Yes. What I didn't hear was how that translates to the use of motion pictures. So can you give us how that how that's actually been applied in your case? Okay, so that's a that's a question that came that's kind of an issue that came up three years ago. When I say text, I'm not I'm not we are we don't no longer just refer to alphabetic, we call them alphabetic text, like typed things. When we say a text it can be a montage. So um, at the hearing three years ago, I remember I had an example of a student that had created a, uh, like a parody or a comedy about some popular movies that create stere racial stereotypes. So in the first year writing classroom, many teachers are having students create texts that are, that can be video texts. So that's the other two groups also that I forgot to mention, um, the American Library Association and the New London Group have some literature that talks about the importance of teaching information on digital literacy. So to create a text is to create numerous kinds of texts that we think students should know how to create with numerous kinds of texts because they're asked to do that in their jobs now. When they get hired, um, they can be hired as a communication specialist and they might need to create movies and videos and things like this for the organization that they work for. So it's Every teacher across the United States that's teaching first year writing isn't having students. I don't have empirical evidence on the number of the percent, but it's an increasing number, and it's something that we know we are supposed to teach, and we are trying to develop professional development materials so that we teach students what they need to know, and we try to broaden what we conceive of as a text. So. And have you personally taken advantage of the existing exemption in your work? Yes. And give me an example. Um, to show examples of speeches, because um, my PhD is in rhetoric and writing, so I'm interested in the art of persuasion, and so I've used it to show different kinds of speeches. Okay, thanks. Thank you. All right, uh, the next person on the list is Renee Hobbs from the University of Rhode Island. I think <laughs> the mic's back there work, but let's check and make sure. Okay, thanks very much. Is that working? Yeah, great. Great. Uh, my colleague Spiro Bowles is going to uh, call up some technology when I need to use the technology. Um, thanks for the opportunity to come and talk to you a little bit about the need for uh, K-12 educators um, to be able to use media in flexible and dynamic ways. Of course, media is a crucial component of K-12 education, and right now the current law limits the ability of educators to make fair use of audiovisual works for educational purposes. High quality image media is ubiquitous to young people today who grow up with 52 inch HD screens in their living room. And poor quality clips, as other comment commentators have noted, lose their impact when learners are distracted by the bad image and sound quality. As other commenters have noted, noted the perceptions of quality change over time change over generations. Young people growing up in American uh, schools today uh, are, are find uh, poor quality clips to be um, uh, distracting and um, difficult, painful even, to watch. Now high quality clips are important for 
courses in film studies and science and the fine and performing arts as, um, as the Copyright Office recognized in the 2010 uh, decision. Um, not just for detailed analysis of image and sound, um, but for their larger communicative value uh, as conveyors of ideas and information. Uh, increasingly, um, DVDs are the only form format available for um, for many uh, forms of, um, of movie uh, movies, and uh, digitization of clips of, is, is required uh, for effective classroom use. Um, critics of our exemption say that uh, we have alternatives like the use of media compilation websites, uh, but the use of media compilation websites is not a viable solution. Um, because internet access in many school communities is unreliable and restricted and filtered. Um, every year I do about 15 to 20 events in American public school districts all across the country. And about 50% of the communities that I work in, uh, YouTube is uh, not, it, it's not available. It's, it's um, blocked by the uh, technology administrator. Um, so on, even on media compilation websites, even if a school district uh, permits uh, educators to access them, there's a limited number of resources that are available. And what is there has been edited in ways that may or may not be suitable for an educator's specific need. More problematically, ads before and during clips are especially problematic because they change. Even if the teacher has previewed the clip before viewing, it's not, pre it's not possible to predict what ad will be viewed uh, during the classroom playing. Um, because one time it might be a Kleenex ad, and the next day, only a few days later, it might be uh, a, uh, an ad for a, a, a violent movie. Smartphone <coughs> screen capture. From, my, from the teachers I've talked to is not a viable option. And um, right now I'm going to show you a, a video that I captured when I was doing a uh, workshop in Lawrenceville, New Jersey. This is a high school teacher at a parochial high school in Lawrenceville, uh, New Jersey, and he's talking a little bit about the challenges he faced when trying to use screen capture to take a, an excerpt of a um, a piece of a, a piece of audiovisual media. Let's see if we can watch that clip now. You put it very well. Let's see if we can. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to disrupt the All right, we'll, 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 show, it we'll <laughs> show it when we can. We'll show it when we can. One of the reasons why we're asking for an exemption for audiovisual works and not just DVD um, is, uh, it is reflected in a, an observation I made this fall of a high school English teacher named Carolyn Fortuna at Franklin High School in Franklin, Massachusetts, where in her English class, the theme is sport and society. She's looking at the way in which representation of sport both reflects and shapes our understanding of social values. And she, w she wants to do a critical analysis of the Madden games, but of course finds it very difficult to bring in examples of uh, the, the, the way the games are depicted and how they've changed over time. Um, she seeks to support her students making connections between the classroom and the culture. Okay, well now we'll hear from uh, the teacher at uh, Lawrenceville, in Lawrenceville, New Jersey. My wife and I are both teachers, and she wanted to show a clip of a video in a class. Um, we lost our copy of the video, we have one, but we, we've watched it on Netflix, we, we, sorry, we watched it on Netflix, we don't have a physical legal copy yet, but she wanted to show it in her class because she was going to be absent the next day, so I tried to get a copy of it. 
the school blocks Netflix from our firewalls. So could we allow it? Yes, but the technical side is, is that our school doesn't allow it. So I attempted to screen record sections of the video that she was going to use within her class. Using? Using Netflix, and I do believe it was Camtasia. Uh, it, was a, it was either Camtasia or another one of the leading ones. What happened was, is that when I tried to record the Netflix, evidently, my Macintosh computer with Safari recognized that this was a copyrighted work of uh, video. When the Camtasia tried to record it, evidently the communication was between the two, and it stated, sorry, you can't record this. So when I watched the video, it was blocking my view. What I saw instead of the video was a black screen. This teacher had many other stories to tell me of the challenges he's experienced in trying to support the needs of his of the teachers in his uh, community, but that gives you a brief idea. Let me talk about um, my fourth point, which is that teachers are frustrated in their efforts to incorporate media in the classroom. Um, using multiple DVDs, searching for streaming media online, watching unavoidable and inappropriate ads, and having to fast forward to the specific clip required all have a negative impact on teaching and learning, especially when teachers in the elementary and secondary grades are trying to build those critical thinking skills by using the time-honored classic technique of comparison contrast. It's how we help students learn to analyze something. We compare and we contrast. By definition, we have to use one, one artifact and compare it to another. For example, John Landis, a a uh, technology teacher at the Russell Byers Charter School in Philadelphia wanted to uh, teach his fourth graders about the history of technology by having them compare and contrast um, two clips from Super Mario Brothers because Super Mario Brothers back in the day uh, looks considerably different than it looks now and if you're growing up as a nine-year-old child in Philadelphia now you don't really understand how fast technology has changed and it can be a tremendous opportunity for kids to really carefully pay attention to compare and contrast in this highly engaging activity unfortunately uh, that that activity is unlawful now the 1201 rulemaking process was implemented to ensure that the public would have the continued ability to engage in non-infringing uses of copyrighted work. The use of media to promote critical thinking, analysis, and communication skills contributes to the development of an informed citizenry. Right now only 25% of the children who are now age 16 will graduate from college. So we think it's vital that these skills be learned in the elementary and second, and second grades. Right now, K-12 teachers have to choose among three bad choices. They can violate the law and bypass a CSS. They can search for online clips, and they may or may not find ones that meet their needs, and they may or may not have inappropriate ads. Or they can choose not to use media in the classroom. Granting our exemption would advance the quality of education in American public schools because Audiovisual works and clip compilations are essential for teaching and learning. They support learner engagement and attention, they increase the perceived relevance of the curriculum, and they increase recall and comprehension of the content. For that reason, we think it's important to meet learners' expectations for image quality by permitting elementary and secondary educators to make uh, clips for teaching and learning. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Bolos, I assume you're you doing a separate presentation. Your name's on the list, but it wasn't right. You are? Yes. Okay, great. And it's your turn. Give you a little second here for me to transfer it over to the lab. Let's
Arturo Bolas. I'm from Nutra High School. It's, um, I'm sorry, yeah. can you hear me now? My name is Spiro Bolas. I'm a social studies teacher from Nutra High School. Um, that's uh, in the North Shore of Chicago suburbs. It's a very affluent district, uh, but it's a public school, and I'm trying to emphasize that for a reason, which you'll see in a minute. So uh, I, I believe one of the main objections in the last ruling, the 2010 ruling, was that um, there wasn't enough evidence from the actual classroom with real students. So my um, testimony today is intended to show the effect of limiting um, access to high quality media on actual students in my class. Um, in terms of what is normative practice for teachers in my building, it's really kind of interesting uh, because uh, many uh, teachers use VHS tapes still. They don't do it for the high quality aspect of it at all. In fact, the only reason they use VHS is because we teach in 40 minute blocks and it is something you can queue up in a very precise manner. Um, and oftentimes, it's not the quality they're looking for, but at least it's not wasting class time. And also as a uh, first time mentor of a new teacher, I've noticed how much uh, new teachers struggle with technology in the classroom and how they are assessed if they cannot, uh, assessed poorly, if they cannot make their transitions as smooth as possible, if they cannot use media in an efficient way. I made a few assumptions when I did my little experiment in my classroom. One of them was that I would, uh, although I'm a Mac guy, uh, I would only use Windows uh, because that is the norm for uh, teachers across uh, America. Most people are using Windows machines, even though Macs are easier to use video with, I would argue. The other assumption I made was, um, something was mentioned just earlier, I used a free program called Jing to capture the media as opposed to Camtasia. My district, because of its affluence, is actually very willing to provide me with Camtasia, uh, which is either a $99 or $199 or $299 uh, suite of programs. Um, but I know that most educators don't have the access to the resources that I do, uh, so I used Jing instead. Jing is a free version, web-based program, uh, web-based version of Camtasia. So I didn't use that because of the monetary issue. To prepare for um, the screen capture itself, um, what I did was, first I found a quiet place. It was very difficult to do this in a public school. <laughs> I had no idea uh, how difficult this was. People kept on breaking in. I couldn't do this at my own desk because my colleagues are um, you know, configured in pods. The second <laughs> challenge was that I had to capture the video in real time. This was also a challenge. I'm considered to be one of the most technologically savvy people in my building. I've often functioned as a technology staff developer, uh, and so I know how to use this technology, but most people struggle, and they give up very easily when there are challenges. And so I had to do this multiple times to get the clip exactly where I wanted to as I was um, trying to capture it. And then I would wait. Um, you know, typically the, the clips can be anywhere from five to 15 minutes. Um, and every time you're using a clip, you have to wait in real time. Now what's interesting about Jing, this particular project, uh, this particular freeware, is that it's, it's a web program. And so when you are done capturing, you have to upload <coughs> the video clip to the web in order for it to be useful in any other uh, place in the building. Um, and so I would upload it to the web, and I would upload it to the web, and I would wait, and I would wait, uh, many, many, many minutes, sometimes hours, to get it up to the web. And this is also an issue uh, in terms of the amount I could upload to the web. Jing is capped because it's a free program because they want to incentivize people to buy the, uh, the more expensive Camtasia suite. It is capped at five minutes total. Uh, and therefore, I couldn't use any clips beyond five minutes. An example would be my Modern World History class. I wanted to use a clip from Elizabeth, the film, the Hollywood movie. And the problem was, of course, that the clip I needed was five minutes and 30 seconds. And that was the most important part of the end. So we set up an experiment in my American Studies class. This is a team talk class. I'm the history teacher. My partner, John, is the English teacher. And we were reading the Great Gatsby, and doing a comparison with, of course, Citizen Kane. 
seems to be the movie of the day. Uh, we called it The Great Gatsby Meets Kane. So we set up two groups of students. The first group was the screen grab version. Um, and it, when we set it up, it looked something like this. All right, so that's, uh, that's the clip we wanted you to watch. So, Doug, I, I can help you uh, scroll through it and where we want to go. Sure, you ready? Yep. So how, how do you think we make this transition from that scene we were watching to uh, the current scene? Becky? Um, well, maybe because we know that uh, the note was about and so maybe we can assume that it's like a biography almost, and it starts in this house, and this is like a pretty important child event. Good. But you didn't see it again? Yeah, sure. Why'd you throw the bladder? Why'd you so jumpy? What do you mean, jumpy? Why are you so jumpy? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like almost like perfect. It's all, it's all white, and then he's like having so much fun. That was perfect, perfect to you? Yeah. Does this look all white to everybody? Katie? That's weird, because Daniel thinks it looks all white and perfect, but Katie thinks it looks dark and kind of ominous. Good. Daniel, can I go back to you now? Yeah, um, yeah, I, see, I definitely see that. I guess it's not like more because like, it's in black and white. Like, I couldn't really tell. I just assumed it was like white. Uh -huh. um, but yeah, I totally see what you're saying. Like, what parallels and contrasts can you find among the three adults? before we take our uh, right here. Matt? Well, the guy on the left looks a lot more rustic than the guy on the right. For sure. You can, you can, tell can you be more specific? Well, yeah, it's hard to tell, but he's a little scruffy. Let's um, uh, play a little bit more. You don't know the the Lord, the Lord, the the you know, I don't know the Lord, 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 the the Lord, the 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 bank's decision on all matters concerning its education and space of residence and similar subjects is to be final. We will assume full management of the Colorado loan, which I refuse to say, you are the sole owner. I picked that particular scene because there was an argument between all of the characters all speaking at once. This is the debrief from that same screen captured clip. Okay, just a few questions being out as honest as possible. What did you think about the the audio and video quality of this particular clip that you saw today? Uh, Leah? It was really hard to understand what they were saying the first time we watched it because it did a lot of noise and a lot of people talking over each other. And so. Okay, so it's hard to make out some of the voices the first time we watched the clip because of the audio quality. Please. The choppiness of it made it really difficult to match the audio with visuals, so a couple times I even looked away so I could just focus on the voices, but then I felt like I was missing something, so I'd have to look back, so it was really hard to put the two together for me. Okay, uh, good point. So uh, the video and the audio seemed out of sync with each other, and you actually looked away so you could make sure you understood what was being said. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Uh, Alexi? If your mouth is really expensive to when you talk, so people watch your mouth a lot when you talk, and instead of listening to what you're actually saying sometimes. So on this, it was harder because the lips and what they were saying were disconnected, so it kind of had to lean in, so it wasn't quite getting what they were saying as easily as I normally would, just because I couldn't really watch the lips at all. Nice. Um, there were a couple times when there was more than one person speaking, and like I couldn't distinct who was distinguished. <laughs> um, who, um, who was talking, so that was kind of... Um, in the scene when Charlie like knocks him over with the flood, I had no idea what was going on the entire end of the clip. Because like, you just kept hearing like yelling, and then suddenly the actor would be on the ground, and I, I was so confused at the end of it, what was going on, and so I kind of had to like think back and realize like, oh, he's upset, but he if we only watched a five minute clip, if you were to watch a two hour movie like that, how do you think of it? I wouldn't watch the movie. Yeah, like when you try to find a, a TV episode that you miss online, and you can't find a good website, and I just don't even want to watch it because it's not a good video quality. Okay, good. Christophe. Well, I think like you can tell a lot about a person from their movements, and there's, since there's no like, fluidity in their movements, they're all choppy. We're losing that whole like, aspect of the person. 
Okay, so subtle details, musical cues seem to be lost, at least with the initial logic, but it was easier the second time around. Okay, well, one more comment there. Well, like our, one more sentence, like our eyes was working so hard to try and focus it, that I think that's why it was harder to hear, because like, we were like, working overdrive to like, trying to look at it instead of listening to it. Uh, cognitive load theory says that when one sense is overwhelmed, then the other one doesn't work as well, so. Okay, great. So um, why don't you guys switch with the other group, and hopefully it won't be as long, we'll, we'll make it a little bit quicker. So that was the screen capture, then there was another group of students for the actual DVD quality clip of Citizen Kane, very quick, look like this. <laughs> to show you we're using the same type of activity with a different group of students. Finally, the DVD rip debrief. What was the, um, the video quality of the clip that you just saw? Raise your hand. What was the video quality? Casey. Good. I don't see how it could be any better. Good. Can't see how it could be any better. Uh, what was the audio quality? quality of? Well, it's not from like the past 10 years, so it definitely has that older quality to it, but the dialogue is clear and you can understand everything they're saying. Okay, good. So we know that the film is old by the audio quality, but it's as clear as it can be. Good. All right. Uh, thanks. And so in conclusion, I would just say that, you know, in a political environment where public education is under attack, uh, it seems, you know, I ask myself the question, why is it that students at the college level uh, some students at the college level who are, you know, a minority in this country to begin with get access to high quality media, whereas in at the public education level where all students attend, uh, they get access only to poorer quality media. Thank you very much. Thank you. I think that's it for the proponents in this panel. Uh, Dean, are you going to go first? On the, uh, yeah. Okay, great. Dean, <coughs> We're also going to have a little bit of uh, some uh, audio visuals, so David Taylor is going to set that up. Okay. I'll be setting that up. I'm just going to start to sure. save you some time. So thank you so much for giving us the opportunity to testify <coughs> today. Um, I'm here representing a CSLA, which is a limited uh, liability corporation of the licensing administrator for AACS. AACS stands for the Advanced Access Content System. And AACSLA was formed by eight founder companies. Those companies are IBM, Intel, Microsoft, Panasonic, Sony, Toshiba, the Walt Disney Company, and Warner Brothers, which is the company that I actually work for. Um, AACSLA developed and licenses the AACS technology for the protection of high definition audio visual content on optical discs, and particularly Blu-rays, which I'll be referring to as meetings. Um, ACSLA licenses its technology on a cost recovery basis. Uh, so what is AACS? It's a robust encryption-based technology, and unlike some of its predecessors, it actually permits ACSLA to revoke keys deployed to its licensee. So this allows ACSLA to, um, if there are non-compliant, licensed products out there in the marketplace to prevent them from playing that newly released content protected by AACS. Um, it's a robust content protection technology and it really served as, and continues to serve, as the foundation for content owners to release premium content to consumers in the home video marketplace in high definition. And I just also wanted to note that AACS is sufficiently robust that it is a resistant easy hats um, and, and it continues to do so. One feature that we talked about with AACS and that will be part of the whole AACS ecosystem 
is a CS managed copy. And this will allow consumers, as well as educators through an online server, to be able to make an authorized copy of the content that is on an AACS protected VD to a computer hard drive through a, copy, through a method that is referred to as a bound copy method. It will also allow um, users and consumers to make a reportable copy onto reportable media, such as DVDs and SD cards. And this managed copy system is expected to launch by, by the end of this year. ACSLA respectively submits that the proposed exemptions for classes 7F, 7G, and 8 should be denied. Uh, the proponents have not identified specific works protected by AACS that are unavailable for non-infringing uses. And Blu-ray discs and AACS has, have not previously been subject to an exemption. And there really has been no persuasive demonstration of adverse effects on fair use and uh, to justify why there should be an exemption for AACS and high definition content, net, content now. I'd just like to note from the last presentation that the student who was viewing a clip from a DVD said himself, I don't see how that clip could possibly be in higher quality. So to sort of say for educational purposes that DVD quality is somehow <laughs> insufficient really is belied by the evidence just, just, just given in the last panel. And we'd also just like to remind, of course, um, the Copyright Office that the whole exemption is a question of balance. Adverse effects on clear non-infringing uses versus the need to protect the integrity of technical protection measures like AACS to actually encourage content owners to release high quality content out into the marketplace. We wanted to make one comment on the 2010 exemption. There's been some notion that the 2010 exemption somehow took away benefits that were um, proponents claim they had under the 2006 exemption because the 2010 exemption was limited to DVDs. Um, the 2006 exemption referred to audiovisual works included in the educational library of, of a college or university's film or media studies department. We wanted to note that Blu-ray was not commercially released in the U.S. until June 2006, well after that round of rulemaking was initiated. Accordingly, neither Blu-ray nor ACS was the subject of any of the 2006 proposed exemptions. And therefore, the 2006 exemption did not, in fact, create an exemption for film professors to circumvent AACS on VDs, as they could not have possibly demonstrated in that proceeding that the prohibition against circumvention resulted in a substantial adverse effect on their non-invention uses. So we also believe that no exemption should be created for uh, other college and university professors or K through 12 educators with respect to AACS and Blu-rays. Really the need for high definition is unpersuasive as I, as I just mentioned in the last clip. And there's really been, um, there's, there was a demonstration as to how some of these alternatives to circumvention appear not to be satisfactory, but that really just hasn't been the case in what we've seen as we have uh, worked with some of these alternatives to circumvention. So we just wanted to put some of those up for just, just a moment. Um, here are the variety of alternatives to circumvention that are available, video capture software, video streaming services, for particularly film studies departments um, and, and media studies department at colleges and universities, the ability to use professional camera equipment to uh, record displays, smartphones and tablets, clip websites, and of course the managed copy. So for university professors and film media stu studies, sorry, studies and students, they still have access to work on DVDs pursuant to the prior exemption and uh, that, we believe, provides more than adequate quality. In terms of video capture software, we just wanted to show a quote from uh, a, a teacher uh, about the Applian replay video capture software that is made by Applian, and I'm not going to repeat the quote. The quote is up there, but they say that it's easy to use, um, it's, it, it's uh, 
will help make my media and film lessons will actually feature some media and film, and the quality was, was very good. The quality of the playback is absolutely superb, and there are no problems with audio syncing. Uh, and here, so here's an important point with the, uh, respect to the video capture software. It was asked at the May 17th hearing in Los Angeles whether the video capture software, such as the product that was demonstrated at the May 11th tech demonstrate, violates the DMCA. And we examined that product and we have concluded that it does not violate the DMCA full stop. Um, some commentators have also pointed out that the particular product that was demonstrated on May 11th is not Mac compatible. We have identified Mac compatible video capture software and we have examined it, but, and it functions in the same manner with the same quality as the video capture software that was demonstrated at the May 11th hearing. And we have also concluded that that map compatible software does not violate the DMCA. So we just wanted to show a little bit, there's been some discussion of smart uh, phone recording. We just wanted to show a very, very brief clip of that, that, that we made um, using Android Razor, Razor Maps. So here's the original recording on the left of the smartphone uh, at 720p, and uh, that's from the movie War Horse. At the right is the clip enhanced with stabilizing uh, feed reveal editing tools. Those tools are software tools. It retails for less than $50, and it's basically one or two punches of an online button to do the cleanup of that. Uh, there are also clip websites that were discussed extensively at the May 17th hearing. Any clip movie clips where there are a lot of clips that can be assembled for presentations. And finally, we talked about ACS managed copy, but I also wanted to mention digital copy. The testimony from the May 17th hearing showed that there are 350 titles between just Warner Brothers and Fox alone that have been released with a digital copy or a full copy of the movie product can be made from the media desk onto a hard drive using Windows Media or, uh, or Apple. Finally, there's been some discussion about, you know, we, we need to keep pace with the quality of media that is out in the marketplace. Um, DVD is really still king. There are more than twice as many DVD households as there are Blu-ray households. Still 75% of the physical product that is out in the marketplace is on DVD as opposed to BD. And DVD is not going away, and it is still the basic touchstone high quality format that is out even in the consumer marketplace. BD is growing, and BD is uh, it, it, it's, on a, it's on a trajectory up in the uh, marketplace, but it is not the majority format. Um, finally, the, 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 the content which is released only on BD um, is, is exceptional. The proponents have talked about a couple of director cuts, some bonus material that's in, uh, available only on BD versions. But they didn't argue that they wanted to make use of these cuts and were prevented from doing so by AACS. But we're merely saying that somehow the DVD format was, was disappearing. Of course, if you're going to be showing a full length picture, as was sort of alluded to in the last testimony, it can always be displayed in the classroom simply using playback from the Blu-ray disc itself without the need to circumvent. In any event, these narrower corner cases do not justify an exemption, particularly since the original versions of these films are readily available on, on alternative formats, including DVD for film and media studies professors. And uh, the full director's cut and bonus materials are available for classroom use in a number of ways that do not um, circumvent. So as I mentioned, BD is on the increase now into the marketplace. Uh, by 2014, FutureSort predicts there'll actually be 83 million Blu-ray players in the marketplace. Um, and so uh, future, so, so it, that's a doubling, frankly, of where we are today. So we're concerned and wanting to see that that 
Libre uh, marketplace continue to develop and grow. Um, and Future Source has also said that there are nine, going to be 95.2 million tablets and 287 million smartphones in the marketplace uh, by 2014. We quote that figure for two reasons. One, um, Blu-ray is just not going to become the dominant format the way DVD did because of all of the competing ways now that digital content is delivered to the marketplace via smartphones, tablets, digital distribution, and, and, and other channels. But there's a second point here, and that is, is that, frankly, smartphones and tablets are going to be a lot more ubiquitous than BD players. And all of those tablets and smartphones have video capture, uh, video recording capability, and the ease and quality of the clips that they can record make it more likely that clip recordings can easily be made and assembled and will be more readily available for educational purposes than ever before, and that's without the need of engaging in any acts of circumvention. So in conclusion, we believe that denying the requested exemptions with respect to AACS and Blu-ray will cause no harm to the proponents, and we believe that granting exemptions is too risky because it will deny EDs and AACS the full benefit of the DMCA protections and would prematurely harm the format before it achieves maturity. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, and good morning. Um, I also appreciate the opportunity uh, to be here. Uh, as has been indicated, I'm here representing the DVD Copy Control Association, which is a not-for-profit corporation uh, located in uh, Oregon Hill, California. Uh, DVD CCA licenses CSS for use the unauthorized access to or pre use of pre-recorded video content contained on DVD discs, licenses the owners of such content and the relating offering and disc, disc replicating companies, producers of encryption engines, hardware and software decryptor, and manufacturers of DVD players and DVD ROM drives. The availability of CSS was essential to incentivize content owners to risk releasing their valuable content in digital form on DVD, thereby allowing consumers to enjoy movies other video content and higher resolution than had previously been available.